Just like that, we're live, live around the world. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, <clears throat> and welcome to the .NET Doc Show. Uh, we're here with good friend, Cecil Phillip. And uh, I don't think he needs an introduction. He's a man of wonder, a man of mystery, a man of excitement and inspiration. And you've been inspiring me for many years. So why don't you, um, why don't you say a few words about yourself and kind of introduce who you are, where you come from, and what you're representing. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Cecil Phillip. Um, I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. Um, born and raised in the Caribbean. I'm born in a country called Antigua, if you've never heard about it. Um, when we're all not social distancing anymore, make sure you go and buy a plane ticket and go check it out. I, I would think love I, to go I, there. I think I, I'll be honest. All I really know about Antigua is what the Beach Boys said about it. <laughs> it's a good place to go, man. Um, 365 beaches. So you could literally go to a beach every day of the year and never go to the same one. So it's really cool. Wow. Uh, we're also known for black pineapples, which is interesting. Um, and when I say that, people are like, black pineapples? Like, why would I eat a black pineapple? Um, the pineapple is not black on the inside. It is only black on the outside. Um, but the, 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 the dark color of the outside means that it's super sweet. So it's one of the sweetest pineapples um, that you can get in the world. So we grow those naturally. So that's 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 another cool like little tidbit about Antigua. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so other than that, like I spent a lot of my career in the .NET space. Uh, I mean, pretty much all of my career uh, since I left college up until this point, I've always been doing .NET. You know, MVC, Web Form, Web APIs, C Sharp. You know, all the things from one place to another. Uh, and now I spend a lot of my time, you know, teaching and engaging with the community, doing workshops, and you know, streaming on Twitch and doing things like this. Although I got to say, this is a little different for me, though. I'm usually on the other side of this Twitch situation. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm interviewer and now I'm the interviewee. So I'm going to, let's see how this goes today. Yeah, well, uh, that's a bit of a secret we should let out the bag. So we're going to be very soon here in the near future welcoming Cecil as one of our hosts. And we're going to be switching things up a little bit. So we're going to have some hosts swapping in and out. And uh, we're super excited to have Cecil agree to help us out and bring his expertise. Because like he said, he's been doing this a lot longer than we have. And uh, we're rookies. So we're, we're excited and humbled for that. I mean, I'm, I'm super excited. I was on two episodes of uh, the On.net show uh, that Cecil hosted. And, I, you know, I'm really kind of stoked because, I mean, it, Cecil made it so easy for me as a guest. I just showed up and, and he asked all the right questions and he just talked. So he's going to make our show like a thousand percent better. Can we share those links? Can I do that? Can I? Absolutely. Oh, that? absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, I want to share it because Cam did a really great job on the show. Um, so, so those two episodes he's talking about, we did one called Bots, Barbecue Bots and .NET Core. We talked about his smoker and some IoT things they did that was, I thought were really cool. And then he did another episode. I'm going to paste this into the Twitch chat as well. Um, home automation with the Hubitats, uh, which is a really cool device that you can do home automation with. But what's different with this as opposed to the other ones like Smart Things and you know all the other things that, there, that are there? Like it doesn't need to speak to something in the internet, right? It just exists at home, like in your own space. So you don't have to worry about it phoning home and like doing all this craziness, right? Um, but then you also have full control over it, which I think is really cool. That is awesome. Uh, well, so we're going to jump right into the checkup segment, which will hopefully segue into the continuation of our talk here in just a second. Cool. So uh, I guess I will talk over the checkup this week since we are <laughs> scot-free. See what I did there? <laughs> um, I love it. So um, this week, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead. It's hard to produce and share the screen at the same time, but I'm, I'm going to try. So uh, this week, the doc is aka.ms slash learn slash microservices. <clears throat> And what this is, is a uh, Microsoft Learn module that Scott and I co-wrote, actually. Um, we worked with um, Nish on the, the .NET architecture team um, to uh, come up with this uh, module built around their reference uh, containers-based 
microservices application for .NET. So um, one thing that you need to bear in mind about this Microsoft Learn module before we get any further is unlike other Microsoft Learn modules, and this is kind of a big deal, this one requires you to bring your own Azure subscription. Now, um, the reason for this is actually it's technical. Uh, it's just the, the the Microsoft Learn doesn't support doing AKS resources within a Learn sandbox yet. It's a gap. They want to fix it, but it's it's that's the way it is right now. So if you want to go through this Learn module, you need to bring your own Azure subscription. The good news, however, is we put together an estimate for you right there to see what it's going to cost you. So you can you can launch that estimate. It'll take you right to the Azure price calculator. So scroll down. Da, 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 da. And basically, the way that I did this was I just assumed you were going to take four hours in this module. That's probably really generous. You could probably get through it in an hour, hour and a half. But as far as the estimate, I just went with the assumption of four hours. So you know, 47 cents plus um, 17 cents for a day of container registry. Um, so you should be able to get through this entire module in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, for, for about 63 cents, hopefully, or less than 63 cents. <clears throat> so anyway, this module is really pretty cool in that what you're going to do is you're, you're going to actually deploy an entire AKS based microservices application and it's going to be working and you're going to test it and it's going to be cool and then uh, and, and we, we actually we give you a script to do that right so we give you this this little uh, command shell line right here you go out to your Azure cloud shell always make sure you are in the right subscription and I am in the subscription that I have named VS alpha so I am in the right subscription and I'm going to paste, and it's going to go. Uh, I, because I'm actually working on a different one, um, it, it points out that I can't run it yet because I have an existing uh, install here. So I'm actually going to fix that real quick. Well, I think this is fine. I mean, uh, our checkup time is almost elapsed. But um, yeah, that link there in the bottom, make sure you visit that. and. Uh, it's a great way to kind of start learning uh, microservices holistically, right? And the, um, what is a microservices? Can we can we just discuss that as a general topic real quick? Like Cecil, what what does it mean to to have a a microservice, and why is that important? Yeah, and I think it's important too we, that we talk about what it is, because I feel like in our industry we have a habit of changing the meanings of things to kind of suit, um, you know, whoever it is that you know is trying to sell something. Exactly. But, um, from my perspective, I look at a microservice uh, or microservice technology as a way that we could write distributed applications in a more um, scalable way, right? So, so what does that mean, right? Um, when we talk about microservices, we talk about units of functionality, like fully functional units of functionality, and not just like the logger is over here and the cache thing is over here, right? Like actual units of functionality that could be you know, used independently or together um, you know, to compose a larger application. But now, when it comes to the deployment and the scaling of those things, like I can scale or deploy them independently without having to disrupt my entire system. So if I think about, you know, e-commerce is like a common use case, right? Like, so I have an e-commerce application, and I might have a service that does inventory, right? And inventory is more than just like a database, right? It's, you know, what's the quantity do I have? Do I need to order more? Um, you know, what kind of SKUs do I have? Like, you know, different types of things. Then I might have a something that deals with payments, right? And payments might be the credit card processing. It might be processing coupons. It might be you know applying um, you know special discounts to a, a favored user or something like that, right? But these are all independent units of functionality that your application could use. But now we bring them together and make a completely new application, right? Like the the larger application. But what happens now when I don't know it's Black Friday or Christmas or something like that? Um, certain parts of your application are probably going to scale more than others, right? Like I'm going to guess the, the front end part of your application is going to get a lot of hits, right? So maybe we need to scale that. Um, you know, the payment processing part of your application is going to, going to get some hits too. We probably need to scale that as well. But do we need to scale the entire application? Probably not, 
right? Right. And so now we can just focus on the units of functionality that are doing the most work, and then we can give them more resources. And that's what decomposing our application into microservices kind of gives us. That's awesome. And that's a great segue. We're going to jump right into our hallway track. The music never gets old. And actually, I think music, man, it's cool. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. So I, for, for our viewers, by the way, I'll, 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 I'll humble brag, humble brag just a little bit. That's, that's me on, on that. That, so that's, um, that's my music. Um, I have a, like a electronic, it's called an electronic wind instrument. It's basically, uh, it's a it blow wind through it. It's, it's a sax, right? It's a MIDI based saxophone. That's right. what that is. That's so cool. That's very cool. I mean, I've, I've been playing around with, and I'm, I'm not a like seasoned musician, but I did play the piano for a couple of years. And I've been playing around with GarageBand. I've been watching like these GarageBand videos on YouTube. I'm watching people make like these crazy compositions. And I'm like, oh, I want to do like a little jingle. <laughs> so I can put up my screen. Yeah, that's um, so cool. I've always been interested in that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty cool. And it, it's it, what I love about it is that you just, you just have it on your computer. It's not like a thing I have to install or something I got to buy. Um, if you have a Mac, it's just something. I was going to say, yeah, if you've got a Mac, I mean, and, and that, I mean, is that really a computer then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, 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 maybe. So, um, yeah, so microservices, we were just talking about that. I think that's a great segue for the hallway track. And as a reminder, the hallway track basically serves as a virtual way for us to come together and have very casual conversations with um, friends through the community here talking about various areas of interest for .NET. Um, microservices is one of those topics. I know you also mentioned you want to share some stuff about reverse proxies and Dapper. And I know there's a lot of confusion about Dapper. And to be clear, this is D-A-P-R, Dapper, the Microsoft Dapper. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, I definitely, I definitely have some demos I want to show you. Um, we can definitely talk through Dapper. And, you know, quick plug. So today, like, so we're recording today at, at July 30th, for those of you that might be looking at the recorded video. I'm actually doing a .NET Comp session today at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time today on Dapper. So, um, you know, I do have a couple of things I want to show, but like, if you want to like solely focus on Dapper and some of the cool things that um, we could do with it, um, definitely make sure you either check out the recording of the .NET Com session, or if you're watching us live, you can check it out, um, check it out live on the .NET YouTube channel um, streaming today. Awesome. Um, so, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about, let's go back to like that definition of microservices, right? And kind of how, like how this episode is even happening, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, like when I'm learning something and not just learning it for like, I need to do it for work and I need to like push this thing out really quick to production, but like, I really want to understand how something works. I like to, to, again, like a microservice, right? Like I like to decompose like the topic, right? And try and understand like what the constituent parts do and like how it functions. Yeah. And so when we talk about microservices, right? Like microservices and cloud native apps today are almost synonymous. I don't want to say they are because somebody's going to come at me and be like, no, they're not Cecil, but they're almost synonymous from the perspective of the technology behind them um, are pretty much the same. And, and when we think about microservices and, and cloud native apps, we want to, we're talking about distributed systems, right? And when you think about a distributed system, it's, I have different services and pieces of things that are spread around you know, the network or across networks, and they all need to talk to each other and figure out like how they work, right? Now, when you build again microservice type applications, you know, if you do it for a while, like you get to notice that there's a certain communication patterns that are pretty common, right? Mm -hmm. um, publish subscribe is a pretty common thing, right? Um, you know, wanting to do things like um, service discovery is pretty big, right? Like mm -hmm. I have a lots of different services, like where do they live? How can I find them? Um, you know, how can I secure those things? Where do I keep my configuration and where do I keep my secrets? Right. And then even something like tracing and observability, right? Like how do I, how do I, um, how do I look at my logs and my metrics? You know what I mean? Like, are there a lot of errors happening in this one? Do I need to stand up a new, you know, copy of this one? You know, like all these different types of things, which is very, I mean, we're talking this, you know, we're going to talk about .NET in a second, but you know, they're very application agnostic, right? Um, 
I think one of the things too, like when you when you look at that, even though we're again we're talking about microservices and it's really focused on that world, these are things that you know these are patterns that you can use in any application, right? So I think for us, and I'm I'm going on a soapbox a little bit, so I apologize. No, but you're good. For us, what we should really focus on is the patterns, right? And a lot less about like the actual branding of microservices, right? Because I think the patterns could apply if you're using you know, .NET 4.5 on a web forms application. You can apply if you're using a desktop application or whatever the case is, right? All we're talking about is that just different pieces of things that compose like your solution are just living in different places, right? And then now that gives you the ability to kind of, you know, raise them up or, you know, give them more resources or more memory or whatever the case is, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I was going to ask about that a bit. So a lot of times, you know, people look at like monolithic apps and they've got these giant solutions with yeah. hundreds uh, of projects in there. And is that really the wrong approach uh, or can that still be composed? Right. I mean, if they're in individual projects and they're deploying separate places, is there any risk of like that still being considered like a monolithic app versus, you know, composed microservices or is it supposed to be truly isolated? So this is kind of where it goes into, you know, everyone does things very differently. You know what I mean? Like one of the things that we definitely don't have as technologists is standards of stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and everyone's got an opinion, that's right? A, that's a, that's a good and a bad thing, right? Because it gives us flexibility and we're not, you know, put in a box, so to speak, but then, you know, sometimes we need some boundaries, right? Um, for, addressing the situation with a lot of projects in a solution, I think I've seen scenarios where that means different things, right? I've seen a lot of projects in a solution and like the, the, the unit of deployment is still one application, right? But like those, ton, those tons of projects are just, you know, whatever architectural pattern they've decided to use to kind of like break those into, you know, there's like a whole project just for interfaces. <laughs> there's a whole project just for services and this and that or whatever the case is. But then there's also, I've seen situations where there are a lot of projects in a solution where there's different deployment targets, right? So a web API or a front end thing or a Xamarin application or whatever the case is. And then now they want to be able to share those resources and those commonalities um, across the board. I think if your code base is the same, as in like if your code base is like one language, like that makes sense uh, to like have it in a single place because now when it comes to like dependencies and source control it makes it a little bit easier to deal with um just from you know like a headache perspective and a dependency perspective um but I, for me i find in the reality of at least the applications and the folks that i've spoken to a lot um most folks that are building really large enterprise applications are using multiple languages and so i'll see like some .NET things and some python things and some javascript things and you know, actually, I even worked at a company. I used to write stock trading software, like in another lifetime. And the company that I worked for, um, you know, these these financial companies, they're like composed of like acquisitions and stuff like that. So the company I worked for was like a combination of like multiple other companies that have come together. But that, what that means is that you have multiple other, um, you know, like development teams, right? Which also meant that like when I went to work, like. I worked on .NET stuff, but then I had to integrate with like Ruby stuff and Python stuff and Java stuff and PHP stuff. And there was literally like almost any language that you could think about was in that ecosystem. But again, that, that, that was the case because we, it was kind of brought together from, you know, all those acquisitions and whatnot. Um, but now like, how do we, how do we get those <clears throat> together? Right. And then how do we, how do we create services that, you know, are reusable across the board? Right. And I think that's, that's now when we start to think about like, okay, well, what are the patterns we can apply, right? Like integration patterns, messaging patterns, service discovery patterns to kind of make that a little bit easier. Did that answer your question? I've been ranting a lot, I apologize. Like, <laughs> No, that was perfect, that made, that made sense. Yeah, so, so, so how we got here today now is I said, well, let me, let me take down a piece of like different pieces of what actually it means to build microservices. And let me just focus on one piece at a time. And so what I started doing was looking at different ways that folks use like these things called reverse proxies, right? Um, and when you talk about reverse proxies, you're going you're to hear people say things like load balancers. You're going to hear things like API gateways, um, you know, which 
are kind of the same, but like some have more specific features that are tuned for certain scenarios than the other. But at the end of the day, you know, we're going to have some type of infrastructure, right? Some type of application or some type of service that's fronting your, your web APIs or your services. And essentially it's, it's kind of like a gatekeeper, right? So I'm going to make a request. I'm going to, you know, send a command. I'm going to publish a message, whatever the case is. And now this, this proxy, right? This thing that's coming into our world, right? Right. And that's why they call it a reverse proxy. When you think about proxies, we go out, right? Reverse proxy, like you're coming in, right? So now you're coming into our world and now, you know, what it does is that it kind of picks the right place for your thing to go, if that makes sense, right? So, you know, you think about things like Nginx, um, HA proxy, um, what else? You know, there's things like traffic if you're in the goal world um, and all these different types of things. So now me as a .NET developer, I'm kind of like, well, I see all of these examples all the time of using reverse proxies and reverse, you know, putting these in architectures for other languages like Go and Python and Node.js. But I didn't really see a lot of that for .NET developers. So I'm like, well, why don't I put together some tools and samples? Again, one, so I could learn how this stuff works, but then two, I could show other folks how, how exactly can we configure, you know, our .NET apps and things like that um, using a reverse proxy. So, so you have stuff to show us. I do have stuff to show. Can I show cool. you? Cool. Yeah, you need to share your screen again, though. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Okay. <clears throat> right now. And I'm pressing the button, and I'm sharing the thing, I think. Am I? Wait for it. Wait. Okay, the button has been pressed. Ah, uh, look at that. Yes. All right. All right. So, so let's, let's start right here. So right now, this is a repo that I have. Um, and this is kind of just like a playground, right? Like this is not a product. This is just, this is just like Cecil learning stuff. Like this is the sole purpose of this, this repo. And hopefully y'all can learn some stuff from it as well. Um, but what I did was I spent a couple of weeks, um, going through what are some of the more popular reverse proxies in the ecosystem, right? What are the things that people are using? Uh, again, not just in the .NET space, but like across the board and let me see how I could set those up in, in .NET, right? Um, and, you know, you folks, you guys are on the, the .NET docs team, right? Like, we actually have documentation about, I think, how to set things up with HA proxy and Nginx. Um, I think Scott mm -hmm. wrote some of those, and, and y'all might have written some of those as well. I, I seem to think Scott wrote all of those. All of those? Okay. Um, so I read through them, and I'm like, okay, cool. That's, that's great. Um, but even though you read through the documentation, you know, it's still like .NET documentation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, I wanted to know, I wanted to understand exactly like how these tools worked, you know? Like if I was supposed to update them and do like integrate them with different things, like how can I actually set them up, right? Um, so I'm going to take this link. I'm going to paste this in the chat for folks that are listening to us. I did that already. Oh, you did? Oh, well, thank yep. you. Appreciate it. Um, Trying to be a good host. <laughs> appreciate it, man. You're, you're, you're beating me to it. Uh, <laughs> So, so what I did was I set up a very lightweight .NET web API, right? And I'll show you what the code looks like in a second. And I, I fronted that web API across all of these different tools, right? So here I have one that uses HA proxy. You know, we'll scroll down a little bit. I have one using HA proxy with some dynamic configuration, which is cool. We'll, we'll, we'll see what that looks like in a second. Um, I have traffic, which is traffic, I believe, came from Uber. I think it's there. It's either Uber or or Airbnb, but um, this is this is an open source uh, reverse proxy written in Go. Um, and so I wanted to see, oh, how can we set up traffic in .NET, right? And so I have some some things there for that, and then Nginx and and so on and so forth. So so there's a couple of things that are there, right? Now, let me head over to VS Code, right? And I'm going to show you exactly like how I configured some of these things. Now, out of curiosity, can we ask a question real quick? Someone sure. Actually had a question here. Um, Dave Brock uh, asks you. He, he's always wondered about when it's appropriate to write a reverse proxy versus, um, you know, various Azure functions like load balancing and traffic manager and whatnot. Like, when is it worth it? Like, when's it worth it to write a reverse proxy versus some of the stuff that you could get out of the box? To write one, I would never write one. Um, personally, I would tell you not to write one. Um, if you could use one that's already existing, I think that makes sense for sure. Um, now, I know we have like some different tools in the .NET space. Like if you've ever heard of um, proxy kits, 
Uh, I know that was one. And then there's a couple others, actually. Um, and these are great tools that you could build on top of to create reverse proxies in .NET. And you know, these are really like middleware components that help you do stuff, um, which are really cool to try out. Now, one of the reasons why you might want to do something like this, actually, so I, I guess let me recap my previous statement. One of the reasons why you might want to write your own reverse proxy or, or use a toolkit like this to create your own might be a situation where you have certain behavior that you want to plug into um, like that pipeline, right? So that you think about like, you know, middleware, but middleware that doesn't run in your app, but runs before it hits your app, right? And this, this will exist in the reverse proxy. Um, you know, things like, you know, whether it's security or caching or auth or whatever the case is, if there's things that you logically want to have run before your application even runs, that'd be a good place to, to write extensions to those types of things. Um, and that's actually um, kind of like segueing a little bit. That's actually what the YARP project is about. Um, if you ever heard about YARP, you go to... I just love the name for YARP. I mean, the acronym. I love saying it. YARP. Um, so it's, it's here at Microsoft slash reverse proxy on GitHub. And this stands for yet another reverse proxy. And one of the main reasons why um, the team is even working on this, because you could be like, man, there's tons of reverse proxies. Why do I need another one? Um, the reason why a lot of folks are using YARP or you know, we're working on YARP is that you know, we need to have like a .NET reverse proxy that you could extend, right? And so you know, if you think about like the wealth of the community in terms of NuGet packages, in terms of like existing code that you're previously written, it's kind of hard to reuse those um, in that type of style if you want to depend on something that's written in Ruby or Go or something else. Uh, and not that, not, that, not that you can't. I mean, you could definitely switch and write another language. But it's almost like when people say, well, why would I use Blazor versus using Vue.js? You know? It's a similar type of scenario because, sure, I could write something in JavaScript, but if I have my existing investments in .NETs and my developers know .NETs and that's a comfortable space for me, it kind of just makes sense for me to, from a productivity perspective, to me, to leverage that type of tool. Um, so, so this is why we have Yarp. Um, when we think about now things that are running in the cloud, then I think when you're in the cloud, like you have a lot of different options, right? Um, you know, in, in the Azure space, we have things like Azure Front Door, which, you know, I've used that in the past and it actually runs one of the applications that me and my buddy, Burke Collin wrote called um, the URL list that I use for sharing links and stuff like that. Oh, that's awesome. Um, that uses Azure Front Door at the moment. Um, you know, we have things like, you know, there's the Azure load balancer, there's application gateway and also the traffic manager. Now, now is Azure front door a specific Azure service or is that, is that some kind of a template running on a VM or, or what is that? Cause I honestly don't, I, I don't know about that service. I know about load balancer and traffic manager and all that, but. Uh, sure. Let me, uh, I'll bring it up for you. Let me put, open this in another window just in case I show something I'm not supposed to show. But, um, yeah, Azure front door is a separate service in and of itself. Um, so, you know, just like any other Azure resource, you can go into it and you can say, you know, create me a new instance of Azure front door. One of the things about Azure front door that's different than some of these other ones is that Azure front door is a global service, right? Um, so that means that you can do global routing and not just within the region, which, you know, some of these other things do. Um, hold on real quickly. I'm going to pull up my, uh, I'm going to pull up my subscription really quick. And I'm going to bring this up for you so you can see exactly what I am talking about. All right. So this one we're looking at here, this is my portal, right? And then we have front door here. So here's our front door instance. Um, and I can show you this because there's nothing crazy happening in here. But um, when you create a front door instance, what you get, you get a, a couple of things. But you get these, I don't know, I call these like sections, I guess. Um, so here you can define what your front end looks like, what your back end looks like, and then your routing rules, right? Because again, when we're thinking about proxies and load balancers and these types of things, you know, we're thinking about traffic is coming in and then where do I want to send them, right? Mm -hmm. Now here in our back end pools, we have two instances right now, right? We have the front end, which is just, it's a Vue.js application and a back end, which is um, a .NET app um, that we wrote. And now with the back end pool, notice here, right now we only have one but I could add multiple backends, right? So I could say, add a new host 
and it could be an app service, it could be application gateway, API management, whatever the case is. But I can continue, I, come back, where'd it go? I can continue to add backends to this, right? So what <laughs> Azure Front Door will do now is that whenever you hit www.drlist.com or you know this domain that it gives us, when you hit it, you know, it'll route to one of these various backends that are here. And they'll also do it based on the path, which is kind of cool. That's interesting. Um, and you mentioned that there's .NET microservices as part of this. And um, LQ Dev one actually asked about that. So I just wanted to bring that up real quick here. That he said that he was at a, a conference where uh, they were talking about Node.js. Yeah. Uh, and that's where they focused their attention with microservices. And they asked, you know, someone asked about .NET. And they said, you're out of luck. So uh, the irony here is that you're in luck because we are literally delivering content on .NET microservices. And actually in parallel to that, .NET Conf is existing with an emphasis on microservices, so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the .NET ecosystem in terms of microservices is, is, is probably a lot richer than a lot of folks think it is. Because um, again, as developers, you have to think about what is that exactly do you really need from your microservices, right? Um, and then even with the project that, again, I, I was showing you in the Git repo, you know, everything that you have in your, in your pipeline doesn't need to be written in .NET, which is the whole point of, of microservices, in my opinion, in, in, in the first place. Being able to use the right tool and the right job with the right combinations of stuff. So that means that, sure, maybe I could use a, a reverse proxy that's written in Go, right? Maybe I could use a service discovery thing that's written in Python. But you know, my business logic is all written in .NET. I'm using VS Code. I'm on a Mac. I'm on Windows. I'm using Azure. I'm using Kubernetes. Whatever the case is, it's about finding like the right combinations of those tools for you. Now, again, like I spoke a little bit earlier about patterns. Um, you know, can I do pub sub messaging and those types of things in .NET? Yeah, for sure. And that's a common microservice um, like building block, right? Can I do um, can I do tracing with things like Open Telemetry and capture logs and like um, with the elastic stack or use, you know, Kibana and Grafana and like these types of tools. Yeah, for sure. You can totally do that. And people do that with .NET today, right? Um, what else do we have there? Uh, again, we think about load balancing testing and you think about secret stores and, and centralized configuration. I mean, like those are all things that we could do in .NET today. Like there's no reason that's stopping you. And then on top of that, if you think about some of the investments they're doing with .NET Core, um, and, you know, they're probably talking about it right now because .NET Conf is happening um, as we're speaking. But, you know, we also have the ability um, that they're working on to create like these single executables, right? And essentially what happens is that like it'll, sh it'll tree shake your, your application and then give you like a single binary that can run wherever you want it to. So you can have a single .NET executable that's, you know, 30 megabytes or even smaller, right? And then you can have that running in Docker containers or running in system D or whatever the case is across your cluster. And, you know, it takes up a very small memory footprint. You get all the perf, um, perf benefits of using .NET and .NET Core and it runs cross platform. So um, again, that's amazing. Just because, again, just because tools aren't necessarily written in .NET, you know, uh, a lot of folks seem to think like microservices and, and that world of cloud native only belongs to folks that write Go. Like that, that's not the case at all. Um, again, it's, it's all about like being knowledgeable about the tools that are available for you and you putting them together. Awesome, I love that. So to summarize, it's basically saying that .NET does have a place in the ecosystem for microservices. And it's, you know, if you're happy building .NET, uh, writing C-sharp or F-sharp or even VB, uh, you can do so and, you know, it, it belongs in the ecosystem. So you're welcome to do so, that's awesome. Sure. I mean, putting applications together is about choice, right? Like it's about making the right decisions and making the right choices about whatever makes sense for you. Um, you know, if you're a .NET developer and you need to write a front end application, if you want to write in Vue.js, if that makes sense to you, write it in Vue.js. If you want to write it in Blazor, we'd love for you to write it in Blazor. That makes sense. Like do that, but you have the choice, right? If you want to write your backend using RESTful APIs or gRPC or OData or whatever, like you can do that in .NET and you have the choice, right? You're not going to be lacking and say, oh, I can't do GraphQL in .NET. I can't do this in .NET. Like, you know, like the ecosystem is there. Like we just need to use it.
So what I'm going to do now, all right, so let me, so, so this is the front door thing that I was showing you. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to that original set of demos that I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, I definitely did go on a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> that's that no, you're good. You're well, good. that's that's the whole point of the hallway track. Yeah, I, I totally like this. This happens all the time. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back in VS Code. What I want to do is I want to show you one, like what some of these demos look like, and then two, like how you could probably run some of them on your machine yourself. Now, one of the ones that I spoke about was setting up like HA proxy. Uh, you know, and running your .NET application with HA proxy. Now, all of the demos that I'm going to show, I have them all in Docker containers. Um, one, because I didn't want to set up Kubernetes clusters, because every time I hear Kubernetes, it's just like, ugh, it's a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> um, but two, I think this makes it a little bit easy for me to, to show you what's in it and then stand them up, but it also make it also easy for us to scale them as well. Now, here you can see I have like, you know, I'm just saying here, hey, I want you to get this HA proxy image, right? I want you to bind to these ports, and I want you to use this configuration. And that's it, right? It's really simple. There you go. I have HA proxy running on my machine. This is my I think the most difficult thing about this is that it's YAML, and I can't stand YAML tab. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It's, it's, that's, that's the way of, you know, that's the way of microservices, right? Like every right, right. microservice thing, for some reason, I didn't make this decision, but for some reason it's using YAML. Um, and I'll show you a second what this HA proxy config looks like. It's not terribly complex. Um, this right here is just my .NET API, and I'll show you the code for that. But like, I have a folder here, an API folder, and then there's a Docker file in it. This is just going to run the Docker file and then bind that to port 443. Um, I didn't really need to do this, to be honest with you. I just did this for testing, but you know, you can do that. And then, and then that's it, right? There's two things in here that we could use. Now, if I take a look at this HA proxy now, right? Like, so this is me saying, hey, I want to configure um, this proxy to be able to run this microservice. Um, and actually, let me take out this port for a second. Now, if I take a look at that configuration file, like there's a little bit more stuff in here, but I want to just highlight the important parts. Right? Now, you can ignore that stuff at the top. Here, this part is interesting. What this part is saying is, I want you to, I want you to do service discovery with Docker. Right? And it's going to do service discovery using its DNS. Now, in case you didn't know this, Docker by default has a DNS um, service that's in it. right? And so you could query it on localhost um, you know, 53, like if you, if you query your Docker. right? This is the port for your Docker server. And you know, so here I'm saying, hey, I want you to use Docker as a resolver. Like, Tell me where the services are. Right? Here I'm saying HA proxy. I want you to listen on port 80. Right, and then here I want you to use these servers. So port eighty, use these servers, right? And then here I define what those servers are. And and, and just let me let me ask a question real quick, Cecil. The the backup on line thirty three. So those are those are um, those are DNS names for for those services, default backend and web API backend. Uh, no, no, no. So these are these are just configuration um, keywords, I guess. And okay. Name value pairs. So bind eighty, right? So so key value, right? So this is a HA proxy configuration keyword, right? I want to bind the service to this, and then here me saying entrance. This is just me giving this configuration a name, right? Gotcha. So my front end is called entrance, and I'll show you what it looks like when we when we actually run it. But I'm giving my front end the name of entrance. I could call this whatever I want. I could call this cam if I want, right? I could change this and be like, this is cam, right? Um, <laughs> But then it wouldn't work. <laughs> but maybe I'll call it Scott. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm just giving it a name, right? This, this, name, this name right here is not important in, in terms of where this sits. And then here, this default backend is saying, hey, tell me what servers you want me to use, right? And now notice here I have a section for my backend, right? So, gotcha. so, so I guess before I go any further, let's talk about what the front end and the back end is. When you think about a reverse proxy, the front end is the thing that's listening to incoming requests. And then the back end is where is it going to send it to, right? Now, that back end might be one server. It might be 10 servers, right? So like, what, what are the things in the back that represents that? But from the calling application, I only know that I'm making a call to one place. That's going to be the entry point into my reverse proxy. Then my reverse, my reverse proxy is going to figure out, well, 
which ones of these things am I going to send that traffic to? Now, that's what this backend section is, right? So this backend section is me defining where are, where are these servers, right? So here I'm saying I wanted to do round robin. So round robin means that like out of all the servers you get, I want you to take them one at a time and like every request just take it to a different server, right? And then they have different algorithms you could change here. Um, I'm turning on gzip and compression type and blah, 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 blah. This stuff is not important. But the interesting part is right here, right? And I'll, let me see if I can make this a little bigger, right? This part right here, where I'm using something called a server template, and this is very specific to HA proxy. I'm saying, I want you to make a query for something called simple API core service on port 80, right? If you come back to my Docker file, simple API core service, and this is going to be running on port 80, right? So this here maps to that, right? So okay. what's going to happen? So, let, so let's, let's, let's go back now and talk again about what just happened, right? So I'm saying I'm listening on port 80 for traffic. And then when, when I hit port 80, I want you to pick these services that are running in the background. Um, and I want the servers that have this name on it, right? So does it route uh, the request to that API? It's going to route to all instances of that API because now, uh, okay. remember, this is a template, right? So if I have more than one instance of it, right, it'll just jump between them, okay? So let me show you. Let me run my Docker Compose and show you because I feel like I've been talking a lot. Let me actually show you what it looks like. Now, I'm going to make my terminal bigger. I need to figure out a bigger way to like increase the size of this thing because this looks really awkward. Um, I'm going to do Docker Compose. I'm going to say, I want to use this Compose file that's using haproxy, right? haproxy.yaml. I want to say up, right? But then I'm also going to say, I want you to scale the service four times. So that means I'm going to have four copies of this simple service, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? And so, boom, it's up, it's running. Now, I'm going to take this back because I can't read anything with that big. Now I'm going to go to my website. I'm going to go to my browser. I'm going to go to localhost 81. So now 81 is like just where I'm binding the HA proxy dashboard. Notice it's, I have simple API core service one, two, three, and four. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Right. And then notice it says, here's the entrance. So remember I showed you the entrance, right? Yeah. Entrance. Yep. Here's the entrance, web API backend. Here's my web API backend, right? But then instead of me saying, go to these individual services, I'm saying, I want you to look at Docker and tell me if you have any containers running that have this name. And if you do, I want to be able to route traffic to them when I hit port 80. So and you want I, four of those templates. Right. And so now I said, I want four of them. And it gave me four of them. That is so sexy. So now. So now again, as I make requests over into port 80, like it will just it will just pick the thing and then you know it'll do the right thing and send it to the right place. So that makes sense. So there you go. That's awesome. Now, so that's one way to do it, right? I'm gonna take this now. I have some some other demos I want to show. So pretty much all the demos are gonna look like this, but now we're just talking about looking at different ways of configuring these things. But essentially, like that's that's the lesson for the day, right? Like send it to one place and then spread it out to different places. And then what's the right algorithm for me to use? Right? Like here you might have like a round robin algorithm. Um, you know, you might do something based on health checks, right? Like how do I know like when one service is good or not? Right. Like because I don't want to send a request to a service that's down, or I don't want to send one that's like really busy with work. Right. So like we have to have like some different algorithms that can intelligently let us know where can I send these things to. So I'm going to close this one and let's take a look at um, one that's a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to I'm going to do the same thing with HA proxy, but instead of just using re the regular HA proxy service, right? And hold on, let me let me Docker compose down this thing because I feel like I might get in trouble if I don't. Um, I'm going to use a service called Console. Now Console is a, a service from HashiCorp. 
Um, we have a console service in Azure that just got released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but I'm going to run everything just like before inside of a Docker container, right? Um, and instead of like walking through the configuration again, I'll just, you know, I'm just going to compose it up so you can see, and then we can talk through it. So our Docker compose up. I'm going to spin up these containers again. The only difference now is that in addition to having um, HA proxy and my service, I'm also going to have a version of, um, I'm also going to have like, a copy of my application that's connected to this thing called console um, and it should be working. All right, so let's take a look at that. If I come here, so the HA proxy should still be working. Oh, unavailable slash stats, All right? There we go. Isn't that working? Okay, it took a second. It's still looking for stuff, All right? So it was down and it's still coming up. Did it find stuff? No? All right, great. So now it's green, right? Notice it's green now. So now it found a service, but where did it find it? This configuration is a little different. Instead of me saying, go, in, go to Docker, I want you to use this service called console. And HashiCorp console is a tool, open source tool. You can use it for free. You know, I'm just using it here on my machine. And you could use it for, again, you can use it for service discovery. So here, console is saying, here are all the services that I have. Right, right now, this one, I only have one, but I can put more than one in here. And just as we did before, as traffic comes in, right, I want you to set it to the service, but now the back end for that information is a different place, right? Now the back end for that information is coming from console. Now, why would you want to do this? Why do you care about it? Again, when we think about microservices, when we think about service discovery and reverse proxies, one of the biggest problems is when you have multiple things or multiple instances of the same thing is where does this thing live and who's in control of that information, right? I don't want to have to hard code configuration files inside of my app settings or environment variables or whatever the case is. What tools like HA proxy and console allow us to do is to have a service that does that work for us. So, you know, they can make DNS queries and be like, Hey, where is this thing? Where can I get it from? And then now, I have a list of servers that I can make these HTTP requests to. Right? So, so hey, do you have a product thing? Do you have an orders thing? Do you have a payment processing thing? And let me know where those things live. So for clarification, LQ Dev one is asking. So the only thing that actually changed there between the configurations was the DNS? Right. In this particular one, yeah. The only thing that changed was the DNS. Right. Um, awesome. But from the outside world, right, you making a request to the thing, like you wouldn't know any better. Right. So you could completely change what the orientation of your backend is. And again, your mobile app or your desktop application, or maybe maybe you host APIs for like as your business, right? You can do like a multi, multi-tenant type situation where you route it to different environments based on like host headers and those types of things. Um, but they wouldn't know any difference. They just know that they're calling your service. And now in the backend, you can configure these things to go to different places. That's amazing. Um, and again, you can use something like console. Again, we have console running in Azure if you wanted to. Um, you know, you can use, you know, again, like I'm using HA proxy here as an example. Um, I have a I have an example of it, uh, Nginx as well. But again, like all these are the same thing. Like the, the point is, hey, how can I send traffic to different places and you know have them pay attention to things like health checks and like and all these types of stuff? Well, that's really cool. I love that. That's super elegant. Uh, yeah, except yeah. for YAML. I mean, I don't like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so I know asked me, would like, oh, okay, well, Cecil, I only see you have one here, right? Like, how do we scale this up? Right? And it's just like the other one we did before. You know, and so if I stop this, because this thing is taking control of my, my window, right? Like, all I have to do, you know, just like we would before, stop that, right? And I'll do a Docker Compose up, and then I'll just scale. I'm gonna make this bigger. I hate zooming into this thing. Um, at scale, I'd say, hey, I want four of them. Or maybe I want five of them. Or maybe I want 10 of them. I don't know. Let's do 10. Let's see what happens if I do 10. Let's see if I break my machine. Right? <laughs> but now I'm gonna spin up 10 copies of this service, right? So, you know, it's gonna take a second. Boom, you see all those pretty colors spin by. You know, actually, when people walk by my office, I like to just do Docker Compose so they can see. <laughs> 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 
like, man, you're doing like some really crazy work right now. I'm like, man, you have no idea what's going on in this room. Well, you see, you see, that's why I see Dave shouldn't have cut me off earlier when I was showing that script for for the learn module because I mean, it looks really impressive. That's what I was trying to get to. Right? <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. Now I feel bad. <laughs> right. But like, look at this. This is so beautiful. Like, I'm not even typing anything. I could like put my hands down and pretend I'm typing when I'm really not doing it. <laughs> and then this stuff is just going to keep spinning across the screen. Um, and and in five minutes, you're going to have a 11 node or 10 node plus however many other pods. Um, right. Right. And it's already running. Now, all the, now, you see these requests that keep happening, right? If, I, if we stop for a second and look at this, you'll see it says check, right? Um, it's running health checks. Right? You see it says executing endpoint health checks. It's running these health checks for me because what happens when one of my nodes goes down? Right? I have to be able to either substitute that with a different one or I have to say, hey, I'm not going to route to that anymore. So again, I'm not doing anything, but you're going to just see the screen is just going to keep moving by itself because I have it configured to keep checking, keep making sure that these things are alive or whatever the case is. Now, obviously, like these are configurable. You could say, you know, I think I have these checking every 10 seconds, which might be a little bit much, but you know, you could check yours every minute or every five minutes. So whatever it is that makes sense for your, your organization. But you see, when I come here now, notice how everything is green now, right? Uh, okay. That makes sense. Because, well, before, because I only had one, now I have more than one, right? Um, and now I have all these backends here that I can use. So uh, LQ Dev one has a question. Sure. Um, he says, you know, in this case, you're using Docker Compose, but is the assumption that it works basically the same way on Kubernetes? Yeah, I mean, it would it could definitely work the same way in Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has some built-in ways that will do that for you, like natively. Um, you know, like so you you hear folks talk about things like Istio. You hear them talk about things like Core DNS. That's already built into it. Um, so, and then Kubernetes again already has like service discovery and some of these things built into it already, uh, so that you could either build on top of that or use them together based on like the subset of functionality that you need because you know so their software is different right like one thing might do a thing another thing might not do a thing so you got to figure out like what again it's about choice right like what's the right choice for what you want to do mm -hmm. the reason why i'm doing these demos and i'm showing this is because again like people are always going to ask about kubernetes i get it i understand it i want people to know and understand that you don't need to be in kubernetes to run microservices you don't need to leave .NET to run microservices. Um, I'm I'm doing it here on localhost. I don't have Kubernetes on my machine, and you know I can I can already you know like this is a small demo, right? But you know um, I'm already spinning up like multi-node in a multi-node environment on my machine that I can start working with. Um, you know I have VS Code. I have um, you know I have .NET Core running. I could debug these things if I wanted to, and I could look and see how the traffic is going. You know I could use tools like Seek. Um, I don't know if you all know about Seek, but Seek is a, a favorite tool of mine. So, so it's funny you keep mentioning you know things like Seek, and you mentioned um, health. Traffic. Well, you mentioned health checks, yeah. and you've mentioned a couple other things that really tie into that that learn module that we talked about in the checkup. So, I just yeah. want to remind our viewers. I'm going to throw this. I'm going to throw this um, link up on the screen again. If you have an Azure subscription, like even if it's like a Visual Studio subscription and it costs you, you know, just pennies, go out there and and uh, check out this module, and you will walk away with a, a greater understanding of how to how, all this stuff that Cecil's talking about and how .NET fits in with all of these different microservice -y type topics. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh so yeah, what I definitely tell folks to do, um, I mean, there's a lot more oh. samples in here than I have time to show you. But again, like all of them do the same thing. They just do it in different ways, right? So so uh, anyway, you, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You were starting to talk about Seek. And I just want to be like, oh, wait, wait, this is in the module. This no, is in no, the no, module. No, no. <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying like if you, like the point, the only point that I was trying to make is that if you want to do microservices in any language, you know what I mean? Like you don't need to be on Kubernetes. You don't need to be on DCOS, Mesos, or marathon or any of those things which there's nothing wrong with those tools because you might you might graduate your microservices to a point that you want to do that but i think today what's important is the patterns right and so this is just one pattern right there's tons of other ones that we could talk about right like again we haven't really talked about observability we haven't talked about like you know messaging and pub sub integration and those types of things but these are all things that you could do in your architecture today 
so that if you're thinking about adopting microservice architecture, if you're thinking about, you know, starting to decouple your app, like these are some things that you could just start adopting now without having to be like, oh my God, I got to decompose the whole thing and I got to set up a thing and that and the Kubernetes and a blah, 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 right? Like we could, you could slowly work your way into a comfortable space for you and you can kind of get that done. Um, now that kind of ties into Dapper a little bit. And I know we're running late on time. I think we got like, we got like five minutes, right? Four. Well, you can run a little long because um, we're actually not simulcasting on Learn TV right now. There's a, there's a technical issue that they're oh, telling me they think is related to .NET Conf. So we can run long. Yeah, They're actually doing .NET Conf on there. I checked earlier. So we're not even slotted for them today. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I did want to mention Dapper really quickly. And again, I'm not going to talk a whole ton about it. Uh, only because I'm doing a talk on it later today. I'd love for you to come to it. But Dapper, um, and so that's D-A-P-R, uh, D-A-P-R dot I-O. And this, this takes it even to a level even higher um, in terms of like democratizing microservices for folks. Um, and it does this by using a pattern called like the sidecar pattern, which is, which is kind of cool. So what this means now like, so when you deploy an application, let me see if this thing has any diagrams on it. Does it have any diagrams? All right. You know what? I wasn't going to do this, but like I have slides for later. I'll just show you like a part of my slides. Don't tell anybody I did this. Um, <laughs> That's great. An yeah, early view. So <laughs> let's pretend you didn't see this. Um, right. So it does it in a very, um, it uses like this sidecar pattern. So what that's, this means is you see these gray boxes that are here? Those gray boxes are your code, your application, right? So that, that these gray boxes might be Python, it might be .NET Core, it might be you know Nancy or Web API or WCF or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like it literally does not matter. Like this is your app doing whatever you like programmed it to do, right? Now these sidecars that say Dapper, right? These have to live right next to your application. So if you're talking about Kubernetes, it would be in the same pod. If you're talking about like just a web server on a, a VM, it'll have to be running on that local host. But what happens now is that when your app or you know the different services that compose your solution want to talk to other things, um, instead of going out and like, oh, I gotta make, I gotta get a Redis SDK and I gotta cause Cosmos DB SDK and I gotta get a App Insights SDK. All it does is it just talks to Dapper, right? And then the Dapper sidecars figure out for themselves where each other are. That's right. This sidecar figures out where this sidecar is and all the other things that exist in the universe. And based on how you configure it, it knows how to interact with these different state stores. Right? So, so that means that I could write an application here that needs the pattern of pub sub functionality. I could write an application that needs the pattern or, or the functionality of service discovery. Um, but then I don't have to hard code any URLs. I don't have to hard code, you know, I don't have to import any additional NuGet packages. Uh, I can just be like, hey, Dapper, go do this thing, right? And here's here's a JSON payload, right? Like I'm going to talk HTTP to you, right? Go figure this thing out for me. And it'll go do it, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so now, again, when you think about what your application looks like, it's it's pretty it's pretty empty, right? Like it just has to know, this is what I want to do. And then Dapper, go figure this thing out for me. That's awesome. Uh, but again, come check that out later. Um, can I show you anything else in here? Yeah, this is the other part of the slide I think that 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 um, I think is interesting. So again, these are just some of the building blocks that Dapper has on it. Um, again, so we talk about service discovery where service is service invocation, right? Like I'm in a website and my website needs to get the inventory and I might have multiple instances of those inventory, those inventory services, right? Um, Dapper, in that sense, acts like a reverse proxy, right? And it does that in a way that I make a request to Dapper, and I might have one or more instances of that product service API. I might have one or more instances of that payment processing API. But you say, hey, Dapper, I need a thing that does this. Can you find it for me? And then you send your request, and it returns the result back to you, right? And then hey. same, thing with, same thing with state management and pub sub and then actors and tracing, right? Like it, it figures this stuff out for you. So that all your app needs to do is be like, here, Dapper, go do this. So, so yeah, you're basically just outsourcing all the infrastructure plumbing within within your microservices app to to Dapper, to, well, to the Dapper sidecars, basically. Yeah, pretty much that's what you're doing, right? Um, 
you know, based on the services that it supports, um, you know, you could just, again, you make requests to, to um, cert, like, uh, use certain URL conventions, right? So they have RESTful endpoints that you call that are structured a certain way. So you might say something like, you know, slash service name, slash method, slash post, or whatever the case is, right? Like, you have a convention that you follow. Um, and essentially, that tells Dapper, hey, do I have a service called products? Could you get me the product with this ID from a service called products? Now, that service might be written in tons of different languages. Um, I might have a .NET version. I might have a, 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 a Go version, right? I might and, want to do A-B testing, right? Maybe I want 10% to go here and 10% to go here. Right? We can do those types of things. And, and assuming, assuming the interface is identical, assuming the, you know, like the, the schema is identical, you could just swap them out and none of the other, none of the other microservices would be any the wiser. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. So again, you just make requests and again, as long as the, long as the, the backing um, endpoint is the same, and as long as the, um, you know, the media type that it returns is the same, right. Then, you know, your application doesn't need to know anything else, right. Just send me some stuff and then, you know, I'll, I'll get back to work kind of thing. That's awesome. So, and you said you're going to have like full blown demos of this later today for your microservices talk oh, man, as part I got of a mega demo, man. The mega demo is crazy. So I'm using the, um, so if you have, if you all have seen Consoso crafts, uh, Consoso crafts is a thing. I think Brady Gaster and Maria Nagaga worked on it, but it's a, it's an app they use for like teach people how to do blazer, teach people how to do razor pages, stuff like that. And I took a really simple app and I made it really complicated <laughs> with microservices. Um, so there's service discovery in there. There's Redis in there. There's Jaeger in there. I do distributed tracing in there. I have a secret store um, in there. What else I got in there? And, then, and I'm going to go show how you can debug microservices running in Docker Compose from VS Code. So that should be pretty cool. Yeah, I need to watch. That's I'm super excited for that. Do you have a link to the to the source code at all? Uh, yeah, sure. I, can, I mean, everything is on my repo right now. So if you come to my repo, uh, I'll click on this. I'll click on that one. And so here's the Contoso Crafts fork that I have, right? And I have a couple of different branches. I have a Steeltoe branch and a Dapper branch. Um, Steeltoe is another microservice um, tool chain for .NET. Um, and they're going to be speaking today as well. They might be speaking right now, actually. I don't know. But um, if you go to the Dapper branch, you can see all of these different things in here. Um, there's only two. Again, I'm using Docker Compose. There's only two Docker Compose commands you need to care about. This one here spins up all the infrastructure, right? So the infrastructure being I have Redis, I have Vault, I have RabbitMQ, I have MongoDB, right? But then my actual application is in the one that says Docker Compose Dapper. And this one has in my .NET application and the sidecar. Holy uh, cow, that's incredible. One of the things that you'll notice about this is that every, and I try to put little comments in here so you know it's not crazy to look at because it's YAML. But what I try to, what you'll notice here is that every instance of a .NET service or application has to have like an associated sidecar with it, right? Uh, so the interesting thing here is you'll see here, you notice I specify a network mode. Right, the network mode for this, for this Dapper sidecar, is the name of this service. Right, so you notice it says product API. So I'm saying I want this product API Dapper thing, right, to be associated with this, and that just means that they can they can talk to each other on local host. Because remember, I said you know we sidecars you have to be next to each other, and and Docker Compose doesn't support pods, so you can't run them like that. So to kind of mimic that, like I, I do that. But other than that, like nothing else is the same. This is just, you know, run this container, run this container, spin up a thing, and then, but this, this now is not just an API. This is a whole application, right? So we have server-side Blazor, we have web API, and then I have a, a worker in the background too, a third service that's processing messages off of a queue from RabbitMQ. But yeah. That is so cool. I'm going to have to go digest all of that because my brain just got like <laughs> morphed into this massive... Yeah. Mixed bag of feelings and emotions. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here for sure. Um, I mean, if folks in the chat have questions or anything like that, I know I showed a lot of stuff. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about it again later this afternoon at .NET Comp. So, you know, check it out or check out the video um, of the recording. But if folks in the chat have any questions about it, I know I covered a lot. 
like we could definitely talk about it a little bit. Yeah, open air. Any questions? Uh, I keep trying to poke them in there and say if there's any questions, let us know. So, well, and and you know, we we also get a lot of viewers after our live stream on YouTube, and you can always reach out to us on on Twitter. We put our Twitter handles on on um, you know on all of these uh, little window things here on uh, on yeah. the stream. So reach out to us directly, and I, any of us could answer questions and and be happy to uh, be happy to educate you. Yeah. Awesome. Sure, man. Well, this has been great. Um, thank you so much for uh, your time today and kind of switching roles a little bit. And uh, we really appreciate you coming out. And uh, we're definitely looking forward to including you in the like hosting rotation. And we're looking forward to that. So thank you. Yeah, it should be fun, man. Um, like I've always been a fan of like, you know, what you guys have been doing. Like I've been paying attention. Um, yeah, even even you, Dave. Like I remember, you did a top one. <laughs> this is a funny story. You did a top one, and you didn't have your hat on. And I was like, I was like, who is this person? Because <laughs> I'm just so not used to seeing you like without your hat on, without a hat on in general. That's I funny. Like, it's like, is that him or is that? <laughs> did he have a <laughs> it, was it was David funny. Pine Six. That's who it was. <laughs> but, uh, I remember you were doing a single on our talk, and you know, I'm just saying that to say, like, I you know, I pay attention to what's going on. Um, and you, y'all have been doing like some really awesome work. So I'm definitely, you know, honored to, to be a part of, you know, helping you continue, like tell the stories for, for .NET developers on the show. That means the world to me. Thank you so much. Um, we're looking forward to continuing this and, uh, thank you to all of our viewers today for watching the .NET, uh, doc show next week. We've got Chase, uh, Oakwine. He's going to actually talk about microservices too. So it's going to be great. This is like microservice month on the doc show. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week.